Ali Miller, thanks so much for coming on to Talk Beliefs from your home in London, UK. You are an ex-Jehovah's Witness, as well as an author, about to release your first book on your JW experiences, The Last Days, A Memoir of Faith, Desire, and Freedom. Today, we'll be exploring your life as one of the witnesses and why it was your young daughter who helped you realize that you had to exit this group. So how are you doing, Ellie? Um, your book will be published soon and your story will be laid bare for the world to see. So how are you feeling about finally finishing this project? Yeah, I'm really excited about it. It's been three years, well, three and a half years, actually. So it feels really good to kind of be on the final push to getting it out there. And I'm really looking forward to it too because in publishing there's a lot of things that you can't talk about and so I've mm. kind of kept this to myself for a long time and I'm really looking forward to just being able to kind of let go and talk about it. Well before we get into what led you to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses let's just go back to the beginning. Your parents come from the Scottish borders and although your mother would end up as a devout Jehovah's Witness she originally wasn't much of a believer at all isn't that right? Yeah, so my mom was um, in a very sort of vulnerable situation for a while. My dad uh, was South African and he had uh, manipulated her really into having me, um, into having a family. And then he left her when I was about nine months old. And she was kind of feeling quite lost. And she had been contacted in the past by the Jehovah's Witnesses, but she thought it was quite strange. She wasn't that into it. Um, and she simultaneously was looking at different religions as well. So she was definitely needing something to kind of fill that space that he'd left. She definitely needed some kind of answers. It was during uh, this vulnerable time in your mom's life that the witnesses came knocking at the door. And next thing you knew, she had joined. So tell us about that. And what was life like for you growing up JW? Yeah, so my mom um, was contacted by the witnesses, obviously, when I was too young to remember. Uh, so I don't remember life outside. She'd been looking into other religions, and she said that one night she said to God, give me a sign. I really want a sign. And the next day the witnesses came to the house. So she saw that as the sign, you see. Um, and so she thought, although she'd been contacted by them in the past, and although she thought that their beliefs were quite farcical, she'd been given a book about paradise, and she thought it was just like fairy tales, basically. But at the same time, that didn't really, kind of that logic didn't kick in when she was contacted later after my dad left. So then she became baptized. She made friends with a couple who studied with her. They were older and they kind of became sort of replacement parent figures to her as well. My granny was a doctor and she was very opposed to the witnesses. She was really aghast at my mom's decision to join. And she, because she was a doctor, she didn't like the blood doctrine as well. So witnesses are known for not accepting blood transfusions. And so that caused a bit of a rift for a while. And at that time, my mom became very close to the couple she studied with. And I think that that really kind of enmeshed her in the religion as well, because she kind of had these people who were behaving as if they were family. And really, they really did help her. We were at their house a lot. Um, growing up as a witness was a really bizarre experience. I didn't know it was bizarre at the time. I just thought that that was what life was like but my whole life was dominated by the religion. So we had five meetings a week on three different days. Uh, Tuesday was a book study in somebody's house. Thursday was a two hour meeting in the evenings. So I was constantly exhausted as a child. We would get home about 10 o'clock at night. Um, and obviously you've got to get up and go to school the next day. And then Sunday was a two hour meeting as well. We had public talk and watchtower afterwards and you had to answer for the watchtower. We also went on the ministry. Sundays, we'd often go on the ministry after the meeting. So we would have a quick lunch and then we'd have a meeting for the ministry where we would prepare what we were going to say. And then we would go out on the ministry. Um, and Saturday mornings, we'd go on the ministry as well. We'd be knocking on the doors of people from school, which was always my biggest fear that I would meet somebody from school. I was a devout witness. I 
really believed that it was the true religion. I still sort of struggle to think how much of those um, beliefs were manipulated. I think they probably were manipulated, but I was very scared of the end coming. We, as children, were shown very graphic images of what the organisation thought or and think the end will look like. So there was buildings falling, um, sort of like fire from heaven, just very, very graphic images that you wouldn't show children. And as a result of them, combined with the fact that at the meetings, they spoke on the platform all the time about the end coming and how um, how your salvation was never actually guaranteed. So you constantly had to be performing like um, works that would get you saved. And because of that, I always felt that I was never good enough, but I also was always scared. So I had really bad nightmares. I had really sore tummies. There was lots of strange health complaints that I had. I was constantly at the doctor and I missed a lot of school as well because I was always not very well. And looking back, it was definitely connected to the fact that, you know, I'm quite an anxious person anyway. And I think having that kind of predisposition yeah. meant that the religion really that it really drew that out of me. So yeah, it was it was a very strange childhood. I also was told that everyone who wasn't a witness would die. So I was terrified about my grandparents dying. I was terrified about my cousins dying. It was really, really quite a brutal thing to do to a child. And I also thought all my schoolmates would die too. And I had a lot of guilt because I wasn't supposed to have friends at school. I was supposed to just have friends within the organisation too. So that was a really strange one, trying to sort of exist in two worlds as well. It made me quite fractured. And as I got older, I wanted to be normal. So I behaved like a normal teenager and kept that from my mother. And then, of course, that made me feel even more guilty as I thought that I was letting her down. So yeah, it just just basically was a mess. It made me really messy. <laughs> that was a funny time in my life. I'd obviously grown up, um, like I said to you, expecting that the end was coming. And what that did to me, it meant that I wasn't particularly ambitious because you're always told that there's no point to education, there's no point to lots of things because the end's coming. And so life at that stage felt very planned out it felt very um, settled and very, you know, you grow up, you get married and you have children. I was 24 when I fell pregnant with my first daughter and she was born when I was just 25. And life felt very predictable. It felt very settled. I had got married when I was 21. And that was ironically seen as quite old within the witnesses. People kind of get married in their late teens. Uh, so I was married at 21 and then became a mother at 25 and when children are born it's very common to give them gifts that are related to the religion so someone came up to my house and she gave me a bible storybook for my daughter and it had all the pictures in that I had seen when I was growing up and all the pictures that had terrified me were suddenly in my hands and I was feeding her at the time and I looked down at this tiny, tiny little baby. I think she was about three days old. And I just thought, I can't, I can't read her the same book that terrified me. It was just the sudden knowing that I, I couldn't inflict that on her. I, but the strangest thing was, was I didn't think there was anything wrong with the book. I thought there was something wrong with me. I thought that I wasn't faithful enough or that I wasn't devout enough because I couldn't do it to my daughter. And I kept thinking, if the end is coming, why can't I be faithful? Why can't I pass this knowledge on to my daughter? Um, and so I tried very much to run away from the doubts that were beginning to emerge. And there's all sorts of ways that you can stop yourself thinking things. Uh, one of the ways that I stopped myself thinking was I went back into really bad patterns of behavior. So I had really severe anorexia as a teenager. And I went back into that because it helped me feel in control. 
and it helped make certain things feel certain, but it also gave me something else to obsess over. So I was so busy obsessing over how much I needed to walk, over calories, over food, that I couldn't have any, there was no space in my head to think, do I believe this? There was no space to actually start considering that I doubted. Um, but I became quite ill and I had really bad postpartum anxiety as well. So that kind of compounded uh, how I was feeling. But yeah, it was definitely the birth of my daughter that made me just start to kind of unpick my relationship with the religion. Well, things finally became clear when your daughter became old enough to hear the same Bible stories that you had read as a child, as you said. And that was when everything began to come apart, wouldn't you say? Yes. Yes, it was when things started to fall apart. So it took a couple of years uh, of me really trying to battle my doubts or actually just trying to run away from them and not face them. And then another Jehovah's Witness came over from Germany for the summer and we really hit it off. He was slightly different to a lot of witnesses, well, very different to a lot of witnesses. He was really well read. He was studying English literature. He thought a lot and we spoke like all summer about mm. doubts really we really spoke about how we felt about the religion um and that sort of made me begin to realize that i had to face my doubts um at the same time i had uh what i would describe as an indiscretion with a brother in the congregation and so I had a judicial committee, which for people who don't know what that is, it's three elders. It usually happens at the Kingdom Hall, but the elders surprised me in my house. I didn't know that it was going to be a judicial committee. Uh, my husband arranged it at the time, and they came up to my house, and these three men sat in front of me on three chairs in a row facing me. The... We lived in a ground floor flat, so people could walk past in the street outside and see so what they was came happening. to you. They came to you mm -hmm. and set up the judicial committee. You didn't have to go yeah. to the kingdom hall. Wow. Nope. They came to our house. Um, and I was asked to describe really intimate details of what had happened between me mm. and this other brother. And they wouldn't let my then husband leave the room either. So he sat there. He was a very controlling man, and he sat in the room and listened to everything I had to say. And it was absolutely awful. I didn't think it was awful at the time. I thought there was something wrong with me for finding it difficult. You're told that the discipline that they'll just give you is loving. So I thought that this was their loving discipline. And I also thought that they were channeling Jehovah. So they were there to decide if I was allowed to remain as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And they stayed until really, really late at night. They asked me many, many questions. And then they asked me to leave the room. And I had to sit in my kitchen. Um, and my husband was allowed to remain in the room. And they spoke about me with him. I still, to this day, don't know what was said. And my husband came into the kitchen and we sat there together while they decided if I was allowed to stay as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. Then they asked him to go back into the room and they told him the results of their conversation. They told him first and then I was allowed back into the room. They prayed and then they told me that I was allowed to remain as a Jehovah's Witness, but that it hadn't been unanimous which at that time made me slightly sceptical because I wondered if they were channeling God, why all three of them hadn't channeled the same answer. Mm -hmm. That to me seemed a little bit illogical. However, at the time, I was really grateful that I was allowed to stay as a witness because I was terrified of losing my mother and I knew that I would lose her. I was also terrified of losing the support network I had because I knew that my marriage was about to be over and I was 27 and about to be a single mom and I knew nobody outside of the religion. So I really 
have to stay a witness and that's what they do is they isolate people to such an extent and they call you know the congregation a community they call it a place of love but it very quickly became evident that there was no love there as well after my judicial committee because then they had um, a talk about me a public talk and the public talk members of the public are invited to you know the hint is in the name and so in that public talk they made very clear what had been happening between me and another brother so that they could warn the congregation and the congregation could decide if they wanted to still um, associate with me or not and it was absolutely horrific I had to sit through a talk and hear all these details of my life that I told the elders uh, just a few nights before and that I had assumed I told them in confidence they never asked me if they could broadcast those details and I'm pretty convinced that the legality of that is slightly dubious as well because when I was writing the book I was told that you have to be very careful what details of people's lives you make public and you would think that making details like that in a public talk is slightly um, treading a difficult line I think in terms of defaming people but this is common practice this happens to people all the time they're called marking talks and so it's a form of punishment and then I was very isolated socially and then the circuit overseer came one day now the circuit overseer is like the leader congregations are formed into circuits so it's a group of congregations and then the circuit overseer goes around them and checks what's happening in the congregations and if there's any problems mm. or anything and he gave a talk and by this time I had split up from my husband and I was divorced and he gave a talk and he said in his talk looking directly at me that divorced people would never gain Jehovah's favor so again I'd been singled nice. out <laughs> yeah it was in 2009 that you finally left the witnesses so what was this like for you did you feel satisfied and triumphant or was it hard to shake off years of JW beliefs. So yeah, it was very hard to shake off a whole lifetime of conditioning. Partly because you have to build a new life and that takes a long time too. But when I left, so the day the circuit overseer said that, I thought, what's the point? Why have I been trying for so long to get God's approval and to get the approval of these people? And I had always been told that we would know it was the true religion because they had love amongst themselves and like I said there was just no love so I packed my bag and left and the Kingdom Hall was above a shop and as I walked down the steps I knew that I would never set foot inside a Kingdom Hall again that was me done and I walked home and I got all of my witness clothes so all my modest clothes all the clothes that they have rules around I packed into a big bin bag and my shoes and absolutely everything that I associated with the meetings or with the ministry put in this bag and carted it out onto the street, threw it into the bin on the street, went back inside the house and went to sleep. I hadn't been sleeping for months and months and months and I actually slept that night, which I always think is a sign that you're done with something. However, that was only the beginning. It took a long time to undo their beliefs I thought that leaving to begin with I thought that leaving physically was me having left of course it wasn't it was much much harder than that so I had to um, rebuild uh, my whole social circle I had to learn to be to function in the world I had to learn to be able to talk to worldly people I'd been terrified of worldly people because I thought they would lead me away from what we call the truth. So that took a long time to readjust and kind of settle into uh, the world. And also yeah. just really funny things as well, like so much of how we communicate and how we belong is contingent on culture. But I'd had my access to culture completely controlled 
So there was lots of music I wasn't supposed to listen to, uh, films you couldn't watch, books that you couldn't read. So there was loads and loads of gaps in my kind of cultural vernacular. Mm. And that made it really hard as well. So people would be like, oh, I remember when this happened, when, or we, when people used to watch X, Y, Z, or I was watching this or that. And I would just be like, yep, don't know. <laughs> um, so it was, that was really strange. Um, but the biggest thing that I had to undo was my fear of the end coming. So I was still not totally sure that their interpretation of the Bible was wrong. I knew they were wrong. And I was pretty sure that they weren't God's chosen religion because they were, on the whole, pretty mean-spirited and pretty nasty. They didn't behave um, like Christians should. But I wasn't sure if their teachings about the end were real or not. And I got very scared after my second son was born and convinced that the end was coming, absolutely convinced. And that was when I realized I had to do something about this conviction because I couldn't live just thinking the end's coming. I couldn't live not planning things. I couldn't live with this kind of temporary view of life. So I had to begin to unpick their teachings and it was at that stage that I began to look at the methods that they use of coercion and control and I began to think about how those influence people within the religion I also thought how they influence how people turn out so for instance it's a very patriarchal culture within the organization and I began mm. to realize that that's because of the way that men are conditioned from when they're little boys. They're told that they're the head of the household and also told that women are weaker vessels. So it sets up this, this terrible environment for people to grow up in as well. So yeah, I really began to sort of unpick things then. And that's when I began to think about writing um, something about the witnesses now to begin with I had no desire to write a memoir I did not want to write what had happened to me I didn't even could barely tell people what had happened I didn't like to talk about anything to do with the religion that I'd been raised in I was really ashamed of it um so I thought about writing some kind of non-fiction expose but I quickly realized that you know I'm not a journalist um and I didn't have the writing skill at that time and I knew that I wouldn't be taken seriously as well because it's really hard to make people see through the, the sad that the witnesses present because it's such a carefully crafted public face so it took me quite a while to work up to thinking that I could use my life as a lens into the organization but it yeah that that took a few years to kind of go right actually I'm going to do this and I'm going to write about it. So it wasn't a straightforward, I want to write down what happened to me. Mm. Um, and I was never motivated by anger or any of those things. I was very motivated by the fact that I believe that the Jehovah's Witnesses are a corrupt organization. And I wanted to talk about that and I wanted to expose that using my story. Yeah, that was quite bizarre, wasn't it? The post just came, and <laughs> you would actually think this was staged, but it's not. Like, actually, big box, even penguin colours on the bottom with a penguin. Ah, that must be the hardback. And I do believe these are my copies of my book. The I do things. have one, but I've not seen lots of them all together. So here we go. Oh, it's an exclusive. Wonderful. It is. <laughs> Look at this. Oof. An actual congregation, a congregation of books, I think, should be the collective yeah. um, <laughs> noun for my book. Oh, my, look at this. And it's actually it's beautiful. So that's the front oh, cover. I want um, one. Front cover. And then on the spine is a little image there, too. 
absolutely. It's a beautiful, beautiful cover. Who did the artwork for the cover? Um, the cover was done by Sarah Whitaker, and she was wonderful at doing the cover. Um, my editor, Robin, Robin Drury at Ebury, she came up with the idea of a door. She wanted a door because one chapter begins with, I am five years old and an expert on doorbells already. Mm. So, um, yes. So Robin was like, right, doors, we need to do something with doors. And so that was what happened with that. Um, yeah, now look at that. We have a beautiful lot of books now. Very exciting. Your book, The Last Days, is out soon by Penguin. In its pages, you go into much more detail about growing up witness, the doubts, the fear, and the lofty expectations of the organization. Ali, is there an aspect of the Jehovah's Witnesses that you'd like to talk about today that isn't part of your memoir, but is something that uh, you'd like the world to know about? While I was researching the Witnesses, I kept coming back to the same question. And I kept wondering what followers are for. I kept wondering why they had to control people so tightly. I kept wondering why it is that they get rid of anyone who has any dissent or any um, critical voices. And I realized that they have a very sophisticated way of raising money. Now, although they say, and it says on their website, quite ironically, just above a donate now button, it says on their website that they don't tithe, and they're always very, very um, quick to talk about the collection plate being passed in churches and how they don't do that. But they have contribution boxes at the back of uh, the Kingdom Hall for you to donate to their worldwide work. And mm -hmm. they definitely see each publisher, that's what every individual witness is called a publisher, mm -hmm. they see each one of them as a unit of income because they used to go and buy some magazines and you basically had to pay for the magazines so they were a publishing empire uh, that kind of tailed off uh, they also used to publish um four new books a year i think it was four and at the assemblies you would buy those books so they've got basically millions of people buying their literature to then give to people on the ministry mm -hmm. And the people in the ministry give them money and then the money goes back in. So it very much works like a pyramid scheme. Now, what happens is they've really become a property empire. They sold their Brooklyn headquarters to Jared Kushner um, for an absolute fortune. They have been building kingdom halls all over the place, building kingdom halls. And what happens is the congregation pays for those kingdom halls and then they have given the ownership of the halls over to the society so they now have this property portfolio worth an absolute fortune that's been paid for by members and also um, built using free labour as well. Obviously they're listed as a charity so they're tax exempt but they have millions and millions of pounds in unrestricted funds. Now, the way that charities work is they often restrict their income for certain, um, like they'll have certain avenues. They'll say like, yeah. this is for this project and this one and this one. And that's called restricted funds. It's quite unusual for charities to have a large amount of money in unrestricted funds. So to have so much money that is kind of isn't being scrutinized either and it, they also have a number of legal entities and the money gets passed around their different legal entities as well so i do believe that they see followers as these kind of little units that will secure them income and i don't think we see them as very much more than that the whole way that the system set up is completely infringes on people's everything infringes on the right to privacy, infringes on their right to religion, because enshrined in the right to religion is also the right to leave a religion. And you should be able to leave a religion without having to lose everyone and everything that you hold dear. So yeah, I I think that it's it's a very, very complicated organization, very complicated organizational structure.
I didn't cover that in the book very much until the author's note at the end because I think that there was too much. There's so much to investigate and so much to talk about. But definitely that wasn't part of the last days. Well, it's really fascinating. Would you like to come back on the show maybe one day in, in the future, a few weeks down the line, and just talk about where the money comes from in this group? Yeah, yeah, I'd love to. That would be brilliant. Well, you have remarkable insight into this secretive and quite complex world of the Jehovah's Witnesses, Ali, and I want to commend you for fighting your way out of a group that you now consider to be a coercive cult. I will leave links to your social media and, of course, to your book, The Last Days, in the description below. And hopefully, we can have you back on the show in the very near future. Brilliant. Thanks so much for having me. It's been great fun. Thank you.